Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Elena Bliley, and I'm a PhD student from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. My paper is called Eugen's J and the By Error Method, which is a new and improved method for executing statistical hypothesis tests. So I'm assuming that we're all familiar with the frequentist concept of null hypothesis significance testing and computing p-values. If you've ever taken a statistics class, this five-step algorithm here probably looks pretty familiar to you. But what if I told you the majority of published scientific papers that use p-values were wrong? This is a bit of an exaggeration, of course, uh, but a recent large-scale study of almost 800 published scientific articles that observed large p-values, out of all of, all of these articles, 51% of them interpreted the large p-values as indications of no effect. This is blatantly incorrect, of course, as absence of evidence is not evidence of absence in the frequentist framework. Furthermore, 89% of published psychology textbooks that introduce p-values do so incorrectly. They just straight up get, up get the statistical definition wrong. Now, some of you might be thinking, this is a computing book conference. Why do I care about statistics? And to answer this question, I will simply refer you to the field of deep learning where frequentist hypothesis tests are commonly used to compare the performance of different neural architectures. So what is the cause of such an issue? Recent statistical literature suggests that it likely has something to do with the blind execution of bright line procedures such as the five-step hypothesis testing framework with p less than 0.05 that we commonly teach to undergraduates. Statistical methodology is of course much more extensive than the simple five-step algorithm but often those who execute hypothesis tests are not statisticians who are obviously going to be up to date with the literature. Rather, they're researchers in other fields who have perhaps just taken a, an undergraduate class in statistics and remember this five-step algorithm that they were taught. And so the cycle illustrated by this quote from George Cobb here is perpetuated, where we practice the procedure because it's what we teach and we teach it because it's what we practice. In order to eradicate this problem at the root, we need to stop teaching the five-step procedure with the conventional bright line at p equals 0.05. But it's not enough, of course, to just say what not to do. We need an alternative to replace it with. Not only that, but we need a replacement method which is simple and accessible enough to teach to undergraduates. That's where my work comes in. In this paper, I propose an updated algorithm for hypothesis testing which takes influence from the recent literature on hypothesis with test testing with neutral zones. Like the old method, it is a simple five-step procedure, and I improve its accessibility and ease of execution by deriving a generalized mathematical result. I presented the method here in the top right corner. The first two steps are pretty self-explanatory. They involve determining the null and alternative hypotheses and thresholding the type one and type two errors respectively. Note that no default thresholds such as 0.05 are supplied. The point is that the researcher needs to just choose thresholds which are reasonable in the context of the study. The third step is where things get more mathematically interesting. Now you're probably all familiar with the receiver operator characteristic curve, which plots sensitivity against one minus specificity for a classifier. This is useful to us since a hypothesis test is really just a classifier with a decision threshold at the critical value. So each test has its own ROC curve. Now there's a point on this graph which is of particular interest to us, the Uden index, which maximizes sensitivity plus specificity. Another way of saying this is that the Uden index, or Uden's J statistic, minimizes the additive type 1 and type 2 error, which I refer to as the by error. For our purposes, it's convenient to think of the Uden index as the minimizer of the by error as a function of the decision threshold, aka the critical value. Anyway, the idea is, after thresholding both types of error, you find the Uden index and check whether the sensitivity and specificity are high enough at that point, according to the thresholds you determine. If they aren't, then the test yields inconclusive results. But if they are, then you can draw a conclusion reject or fail to reject the null. So before I go on, 
I'm going to give you five good reasons why you should use and teach my method. Number one, remember those pesky p-values which are frequently misinterpreted? Well, with my method, we don't need them anymore. Number two, and this is partially due to what I just mentioned, accessibility. It's a simple method that can easily replace what we currently teach, and by leaving out p-values is arguably easier to understand. Three, unlike the traditional five-step null hypothesis significance testing method, my method allows for a third outcome beyond rejecting and failing to reject the null, inconclusive results. This is important because it blurs the problematic bright line which facilitates the type of dichotomistic thinking that results in blind execution of a statistical procedure to get a yes or no answer about a research question. Number four and five are kind of blurred together. Um, so unlike the old method, mine explicitly incorporates contextual error analysis, both in general and explicitly with respect to type two error. This is important because again, it discourages blind execution of an algorithmic procedure in research, as well as propagating type two error analyses, which often fall under the shadow of p-values and type one error. Probably the most technically challenging step to my method is the one where you have to find the Uden index. To remedy this, I've proved that for any symmetric continuous unimodal sampling distribution in a test for mean shift, the Uden index is found halfway between the null and the alternative values of the mean. I won't go into much more detail on the proof, but the heuristics are available in these two graphs and the rest of the proof is in the paper. Furthermore, simulation results indicate that my method performs hypothesis classification more accurately than the traditional method. Finally, I want to give one more plug for my method by pointing out how it is in line with previous researchers' recommendations. Specifically, including a neutral zone for inconclusive results propagates the acceptance of uncertainty, and the explicit incorporation of contextual error analysis propagates big T thoughtful research, both of which were recommended in a recent article by one of the leading statisticians in the field, Wasserstein. Thanks for listening to my talk. If you'd like to connect with me, uh, my socials are available on this uh, on this screen and some of the references are available on the left.